Good morning and uh, welcome to worship here at Zion. We are privileged and blessed to be able to gather together uh, to have the freedom and the health to be able to do this and worship the Lord and to hear from his word. Uh, If you're visiting with us this morning, welcome to you. We're thankful that uh, the Lord has brought you here and pray that you would be blessed in our worship service today. I I do have a few announcements. Uh, First of all, Good Friday is this Friday and so we have our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. We will celebrate the Lord's Supper in that service, so I uh, encourage you and invite you to be here Friday night for that. Uh, Blast is this Wednesday night. I think uh, Texas Roadhouse is on the, the dinner schedule, so if you haven't signed up for dinner yet, uh, you can do that in the fellowship hall today. Uh, Impact, which is our high school ministry, is hosting a mystery, menor, mystery menu dinner on April 20th, and um, Teresa, is it similar to what we experienced last year? Okay, so I got to be part of a little modified version of this last year. It's really, really fun. So you want to make sure that you come to this. It's a really enjoyable time. It's a fundraiser for our youth group. Uh, There's more information in the bulletin about this, but I would encourage all of you to come out to that on Saturday, April 20th. Uh, Dinner for eight groups will be starting back up soon. If you would like to be part of one of those groups, please sign up no later than next Sunday because we want to get those groups made up really soon. So... Uh, Sign up either today or next Sunday if you haven't done so already. Uh, Profession of Faith class starts this morning. This is a class that is designed primarily for middle school and high school students who desire to publicly profess their faith in Christ. And so uh, middle school students, high school students, if you're interested in that, we will meet in the council room this morning, uh, normal Sunday school time. We'll start that class today. So make sure that you come to that if you're interested. And then lastly, uh, the children are going to be singing in the sanctuary this morning after the service. Uh, They're going to be practicing for our Easter service next Sunday. And so children, if you would make sure that you stay in the sanctuary after the service is over uh, because you're going to practice in here today. I'm going to ask you all to stand with me as we have a moment of silent prayer. And we ask for the Lord's blessing upon our service, so let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the blessing of this day, and we pray that uh, we would worship you and praise you this morning from hearts of thankfulness for who you are and for all that you have done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Today is Palm Sunday. Uh, Today is the day when we uh, remember that uh, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, We're going to look at that in a little bit more detail tonight. Uh, But our call to worship is from Zechariah chapter 9, which actually is a prophecy of that very event. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt full of a donkey. Jesus came in humility, and he came in humility to suffer and to die for us so that we might be redeemed, so that we might have eternal life. And that is a a wonderful truth that we celebrate every Sunday and hopefully all the days of our lives, that Jesus came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And this morning, as God's people, God greets us, and so receive the greeting of our God and King. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing together number 325, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. We'll sing all three stanzas, and let's remain standing as we sing.
Please take your Bibles and turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, We will read a passage in just just a moment that uh, is a familiar one to us uh, at this time of year when we consider uh, the sufferings of Christ on our behalf. Isaiah chapter 53, Uh, we'll begin reading at verse 1 and uh, we'll read the entire chapter. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who consider that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities." Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Children, this is a really amazing chapter. And and one of the reasons it's so amazing is that it was written 700 years before Jesus was born. And you might wonder, how could could there be such amazing detail? Well, this is God's word. Uh, This is God speaking truth to us uh, of something that will happen in the future. And and we look at this passage, and and most of us here have heard this passage read. Um, I've preached a sermon on this before. It it talks about the sufferings of Christ. It it talks about the fact that, that he would come and he would take the punishment that we deserve. Now now you might wonder, you mean all of my sins, even the really, really bad ones. There might be times in your life when you, you remember something that you did in the past. Maybe it was something that was not very good at all. Children, maybe you remember something you did or said to your parents or to one of your brothers or sisters or you did something at school And you think to yourself, would God really forgive that sin of mine? Think about all the sins we've committed that we don't even know about, really. And yet God knows all of them. He knows everything we've ever done. Was Jesus really pierced for all of my transgressions? Was he really crushed for all of my iniquities? Did God really lay all of my sins on Jesus. And, and maybe there's a time in your life when, again, you, you struggle with this idea. You struggle with the concept of thinking that, that God would forgive you of this really bad sin that you had committed. Has God really forgiven me all of my sins? There was a pastor in the 19th century whose name was Octavius Winslow. He, he was a 
Uh, pastor in England for a number of years. He came over to America. He was a pastor here as well. At a certain point in his ministry, he, he wrote these words. He said, if God has laid your sins upon the son of his love, you may rest assured that he will never lay them a second time upon you. If Christ has borne your sins and atoned for your sins, your sins can never be found again. Yes, Jesus paid for all of your sins. Next Sunday morning, or next Friday night, actually, we're going to We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Every time we do that, it is a a reminder to us of the the great truth that all of our sins were laid upon Jesus, not just the the semi-bad ones, and now it's up to you to atone for the really bad ones. All of our sins were laid upon Jesus. He paid the debt so that we would be free. So Christian, stop beating yourself up over your past sins. Now I'm not saying just live however you want. Of course I'm not saying that. But stop beating yourself up over your past sins and stop worrying that your sins may be too great for God to forgive. He forgives all of them in Jesus. He laid all of your sins upon Jesus. God has told you, he has promised you in his word that Jesus paid it all for all who would believe in him. We're going to come before the Lord in a moment of prayer, confession, and and also rejoicing in the good news of the gospel, but let's bow together before him. Heavenly Father, we recognize and, and we confess that there are times in our lives when we doubt the gospel, times when we wonder, is is this news too good to be true? Times when we may think that there are some sins that we have committed that are too great for you to forgive. And yet, Lord, your word is clear. You tell us, Lord, that you laid all of our sins upon Jesus so that they might be forgiven, so that they might be removed from us. Lord, we rejoice this morning that he bore all of our sins. He atoned for all of our sins. They were all laid upon him, and they will never be laid upon us again. Help us to rejoice in this message. Help us to rejoice in this news. Help us to find true comfort and true peace. In the good news of Jesus Christ, we pray this in his name. Amen. Micah chapter 7 says those wonderful words that that God has cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. And that means he's done with them. He, He remembers them no more. That's a glorious truth. All of your sins, Christian have been dealt with, paid for, and atoned for. We're going to sing together number 352, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. A beautiful hymn, a hymn that uh, every stanza ends the same way, Hallelujah, What a Savior. And if we're believers in Jesus this morning, we, we all would say that. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, what a Savior we have in Jesus Christ. We'll sing the five stanzas and let's stand as we sing.
If we were still in our sins, we would have no right to come into God's presence in prayer. Uh, But the Bible tells us that uh, forgiven of our sins and clothed in the righteousness of Christ, uh, God calls us to come to his throne of grace. That's not just on Sundays, but it's all throughout the week. Christian, you can go to him anytime in prayer, and, and he will hear your prayer. He is your loving Heavenly Father who loves to hear the prayers of his children. And so uh, as we come to the Lord in prayer this morning, remember that. Remember who we are in Christ and, and remember that God loves to hear our prayers. And so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we praise you. We worship you. We adore you for who you are and for all that you have done for us. You are holy, you are sovereign, you are all-powerful, you are infinite, you are eternal. You are the great, majestic, transcendent creator, sustainer, and sovereign king over all. At the same time, Lord, you are merciful and gracious You are compassionate. You are full of loving kindness and steadfast love. And Father, because of Jesus, you call us to come before you. And what a a joy it is, what a comfort it is to know that, that any time of day, any time of night, we can come before you and you will hear us. And what a what a wonderful thing it is to know that you will answer our prayers according to your will. And so, Lord, we we thank and praise you this morning for our great salvation. Lord, we know that it is something that that we take for granted throughout the week, that we don't think often enough of all that we have in Christ. Lord, to think that that all of our sins have been forgiven, To, to think that you have buried them in the depths of the sea, that you remember them no more, To to think that you say to us, there is therefore now no condemnation, no judgment to those who are in Christ. Lord, what a wonderful reality that is. Help us, Lord, to to be a thankful people. Help us to live our lives in in light of your grace to us. Help us as well to take this good news to those you place in our lives, at, at work, at school, in our neighborhoods. Lord, give us avenues in which to share the gospel. We pray, Lord, this morning for those we know who do not know Christ. Father, whether it's a family member or a friend or someone we work with or go to school with, it it grieves us, Lord, to know that, that they are lost, that they are headed for an eternity of, of your judgment. We pray, Father, that that you would work in their lives, that you would open their hearts, that that you would convict them of their sin, that that you would point them to Christ, and that you would bring them to Christ in faith, that they might know the, the beauty and the glory of the salvation that we know. Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for all those who serve here so faithfully. We pray that you would bless the ministry here at Zion and and use us to, to publish the good news of the gospel, to teach the full counsel of your word, to love one another, to serve one another, to use our gifts to be a blessing to others. We thank you for our elders as they shepherd your people. We thank you for our deacons as they uh, model and, and carry out the, the love of Christ among his people. Bless their ministries, Lord, and and use them for your glory. We pray for those who are enduring physical trials. We pray especially, Lord, for Tony Visser, that that you would give Tony and Effie comfort. We pray that you would give them answers, the doctor's answers in how to treat Tony. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you that our lives are in your hands. We thank you that you are sovereign over the big things and the little things. And again, we pray, Lord, for those who are suffering, that you would comfort them. We pray for those who are lonely or anxious, mourning. We pray that you would 
bring them to a place again where they would know that you are with them. Father, we thank you for all that you have blessed us with. We pray that as we give as a, a response of our gratitude to Rip and Christian this morning, we, we continue to pray for the school, that you would bless the ministry and the work there and use it for your glory. Help us as we open your word and study it this morning to, to see Jesus, to see his great power, to see his love and his compassion, and to be reminded again of what he has done for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We now give to Rip and Christian tuition relief, and that offering will now be taken.
Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Joanne. We're going to sing uh, number 119E. Number 119E, Teach Me, O Lord, Your Way of Truth. Uh, We'll sing all four stanzas, and let's stand together as we sing. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. We're going to begin reading uh, at verse 22 and read through verse 33. Uh, we've moved, uh, at least for today, uh, into the New Testament portion of our series on favorite Bible stories. We do have one more Old Testament story that we're going to get to um, the week after Easter, Uh, but I think we have about four to six more sermons left in this series, and this morning we're in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, beginning at verse 22, says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, and for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. One of the things that we need to be careful uh, to avoid when, when reading our Bibles is focusing merely on the human characters. Uh, the, the Bible is not a book of be better, try harder stories. The, the Bible is not a book primarily about dare to be a Daniel or be like David, or don't be like Peter. It's not a book about how you fight the giants in your life, or 
what to do when you get thrown to the lions. We want to read our Bibles the way the Bible tells us to read our Bibles. And that's very important. The, the Bible tells us that, that all of Scripture is designed to point us to Jesus. And so when we read our Bibles, whatever story it may be that we're reading, we, we want to see what does this story teach me about my Savior? What does this story teach me about God and his plan of salvation? Charles Spurgeon, the, the great Baptist preacher, once quoted the, the words of another pastor who emphasized the importance of being Christ-centered when reading our Bibles. This man said this. He said, Do you not know that from every little town and village and tiny hamlet in England, there is a road that leads to London? Whenever I get a hold of a passage, I say to myself, there is a road from here to Jesus, and I will keep on this path until I get to him. All of Scripture is designed to point you to your Savior. Now, that's much easier to do, obviously, in Matthew than it is in, let's say, Leviticus or Deuteronomy. But but we don't want to fall into the trap this morning of of looking at this passage as mainly a story about Peter's lack of faith. That's how we may be tempted to read this story. But more importantly, this is a story about Jesus. This is a story about his power. This is a story about his love. This is a story about who he is to you. And that's what we want to see this morning. There are three parts to this passage. First of all, there is solitude. Then there is storm. And then there is stillness. Solitude, storm, and stillness. Children, Jesus at this point has just performed an amazing miracle. Most of you know what this miracle is. He He took five loaves of bread and two fish and turned it into enough food to feed a crowd of probably 25,000 people. It was the feeding of the 5,000, but with those 5,000 were women and children. So most scholars say it was a crowd of probably 25,000 people. Now that wasn't a miracle that was designed merely to impress the crowds, to make them go, wow, look at his power. It it wasn't a miracle designed merely to meet their physical needs because they were hungry. This was a miracle. This was a sign that pointed to a greater reality that Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the one. He is the only one who can meet that, that deep spiritual hunger that all of us have. And so Jesus has just done this amazing miracle. And at this point, we're told that he tells the disciples to get into a boat and go across the Sea of Galilee. And then verse 22 adds an interesting piece of information. We are told that Jesus now dismisses the crowds. Basically, Jesus says, okay, this is over. We're done here. It's time for you to go home. Now, Now, you might think that this is a little bit odd, I think that this is a little bit odd if you just read this. Wouldn't this be a great opportunity for Jesus? He's got this huge crowd of 25,000 people in front of him. Thousands and thousands and thousands of men, women, and children. They've just seen him do something that they had never seen done before. Something that none of us have ever seen done before. Isn't this the perfect opportunity for for Jesus to teach them more about himself and more about his kingdom? Jesus, why would you tell all of these people, we're done here, time to go home? Well, John's parallel account, you, you know that often in the Gospels, the four Gospel writers all talk about the same thing. Well, John's parallel account in John chapter 6 gives us a clue. Listen to what it says. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew to the mountain by himself. The Jews were not looking for a Messiah who would save them from their sins. The the Jews were were not looking for a Messiah who would come and, and deliver them and rescue them from the wrath of God that they deserved. Children, 
The Jews in that time were looking for a Messiah who would throw off Roman oppression and, and who would set up a powerful, earthly Jewish kingdom. And, and after seeing this miracle, after seeing Jesus taking five loaves of bread and two fish and, and feeding all this, these people, they think to themselves, we found our guy. We found the guy who's going to get us out of this Roman mess. We find the guy who's going to give us everything we want, earthly. We found him. But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus said to Pilate in, in John 18, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus didn't come to set up an earthly kingdom. He, he came to establish a spiritual kingdom in the lives and hearts of his people. But the Jews didn't get that. The Jews thought, if this guy can do this with five loaves of bread and two fish, just imagine what he can do to the Romans. But that's not why Jesus came. And so Jesus knows what's on their hearts. They, he, he knows that they want to make him an earthly king. He hadn't come to do that. He, he hadn't come to be a, kingdom, a king over one ethnic group, one nationality. It, was, it would not be just the, the Jews ruling over all. This kingdom would extend to all the earth. We're, we're living examples of this this morning, sitting here in Ripon, California. That Jesus came to, to establish a kingdom that would spread all throughout the globe. And so when Jesus perceives what this crowd wants to do, he, he sends them away. And after this, notice what he does. He He goes up on the mountain by himself in order to pray. You know, when you read through the Gospels, you you find out that that Jesus' prayer life is spoken of very often. For example, we, we know when Jesus would pray. We know how long Jesus would pray. Mark chapter 1 tells us that, that Jesus prayed in the early morning hours when it was still dark. Matthew 26 says that Jesus prayed late at night. Luke 6 says that Jesus spent an entire day in prayer. And so we know when he would pray. We know how long he would pray for. We also know what he prayed for. For example, in Matthew 26, he he prayed for himself. In John 17, he he prayed for his disciples. He prayed for, for all whom he came to save, including you and me. He prayed for us. In John 17. And and so as we're told here in Matthew 14 that that Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray, we we can assume that that we know what he's praying for. He's praying for himself. He's praying for his disciples. We we can assume he's he's spending many hours in prayer here. Notice the time stamps if you have your Bible open. Verse 23 says, When evening came, The evening that's being referred to there is the the period of time between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. And then look at verse 25. It talks about the the fourth watch of the night. Children, when you were on a boat and you were going across, the, for example, the Sea of Galilee, there would be four watches, four three-hour shifts where, where someone was always on watch. The first watch was from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The second watch was from 9 p.m. to midnight. The third watch was from midnight to 3 a.m. And the fourth watch was from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And and so these time stamps are very helpful in in basically telling us that that our passage is taking place sometime between 6 and 9 p.m. in the beginning and 3 and 6 a.m. in the end. In other words, a possible 12-hour period of time. Jesus is praying for perhaps as many as 8 to 10 hours. As Jesus is praying, the disciples are in the middle of something absolutely terrifying. And that's the second part of our passage, which is the storm. Jesus sends the disciples away in a boat, and now they're out on the Sea of Galilee. Notice what we're told in verse 24. The boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. That word beaten is a very interesting word. It also can be translated tormented or tortured. 
The, the picture here is that this is not some mild storm. We had a, we had a little rain blow through Ripon here yesterday afternoon. It was pretty mild. This is not a mild storm here in Matthew 14. This is a, a violent storm. Here are the disciples in a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and their boat is literally being tortured by a storm, a severe, serious storm. Now, you remember the disciples found themselves in a, in a similar situation back in chapter 8 of Matthew, but there was one difference. In Matthew 8, Jesus was with them. Here, he's not with him. And the disciples probably know that, that Jesus is not going to come to them on another boat because John's parallel account tells us that there's only one boat. And that's the boat that the disciples are in. This is a terrifying situation. And remember, if Jesus has been praying for eight to ten hours, the disciples have been in this boat for eight to ten hours. Children, some of you don't like Thunder and lightning, right? Some of you don't like wind when it's really windy. Imagine, imagine how terrifying, how scary this would be. It's dark. Most of us don't like the dark. The wind is howling. The waves are crashing against your boat. You're out in the middle of a lake, and you've been out there for hours. They're in a horrible predicament. Did you know that in normal conditions, it would have taken them about two hours to go across that lake? Two hours. But, but here it's taken them eight to ten hours to go about three miles. That's not good. This is a really, really bad predicament. And it's not like the disciples were disobeying the Lord. So sometimes, you, you know this to be true, sometimes you, you disobey the Lord, you, you do something that doesn't honor him, and you put yourself in a bad predicament. There are consequences sometimes to our actions. But, but it's not like that they were disobeying the Lord. Jesus told them to do this. He told them to get into the boat and go across the lake. And, and I think in this, this is a reminder for us this morning that following Jesus is costly. We, we start our profession of faith class this morning and and one of the things that, that I always will say to the students is that this is, this is not the end of your journey when you make a profession of your faith. This is a sense, a beginning or another stage of your walk with Christ. And, and following Christ is not easy. Many of you know that following Jesus can be costly. Following Jesus doesn't mean that all of life is going to be smooth sailing. Everything's wonderful. Kids are well behaved. Work is great. School is amazing. Church life is the best. That's just not true. Even when we seek to live our lives in accordance with God's commandments, we're going to face storms, we're going to face trials. Well, Jesus knows exactly what these disciples are going through. He's God. He knows all about this storm, and he's praying for them. And I find great comfort in this this morning. The book of Hebrews says in, in Hebrews 7.25, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Since, listen to this, he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives to make intercession for them. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is always interceding for you. Now how he does that, with all of his people, it's a mystery to us. But the Bible tells us this. He always lives to intercede for us. And so as we face the storms of life, as we face trials and difficulties, as, as you face interpersonal relationship conflict, as you face health issues, you might feel all alone. You, you can know that your Savior hasn't left you alone. He hasn't left you to fend for yourself. He 
He's praying for you. Just as he was praying for his disciples in the middle of the lake that day. There's not one single struggle of yours that he doesn't know about. Not one. There's not one single burden that you're bearing that he doesn't know about. You can know that in every storm of life, Jesus is praying for you. Verse 25 tells us that in the fourth watch of the night, this would have been again between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Jesus is walking on the water toward the disciples. Now, isn't it interesting that the text tells us this really rather matter-of-factly? Just like you and I might walk down the street. Here comes Jesus walking on the water. Of course he can do this. He's the one who made the water. He can do whatever he wants to do. The disciples see this. They freak out. They say it's a ghost. Mark adds a a couple of pieces of information that, that Matthew doesn't add. First of all, Mark tells us that they all saw Jesus. In other words, it wasn't just one of the disciples who saw Jesus. It wasn't as if one of them got seasick and was hallucinating and thought, that looks like Jesus. They all saw him. And second, Mark tells us the reason they didn't believe that it was Jesus is because they didn't understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. They had just witnessed this amazing miracle, an amazing supernatural event, but instead of rejoicing in Jesus' power, they, they panic. So they all see this figure walking toward them, And they think it's a ghost. But immediately, you see the word immediately? Jesus speaks to them. That word immediately is a beautiful word because it reminds us that that Jesus doesn't leave these men in their fear. He doesn't go, you know what, these guys just don't get it. They've been with me all this time. They've seen all these miracles. I turned water into wine. I healed the sick. I multiplied bread and fish. I fed 25,000 people. And they're still afraid. I'm going to let them freak out a little longer. We do stuff like that sometimes, don't we? Our kids don't get something and we think they should have gotten it and and we think, you know what, I'm going I'm to let him stew in this a little bit. Jesus doesn't do that. Immediately, he says to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. If you're a, if you're a Bible underliner, underline that phrase, it is I. It is I. It's a phrase that our English translations don't, unfortunately, they don't capture it all that well because literally Jesus says this, take heart, I am, do not be afraid. The ESV translates it, it is I. I think most versions translate it, it is I. But, but in Greek, it's ego eimi, which means I am Children, does that phrase, I am, ring any kind of bell with you? It should. But because that's the name God used for himself in the burning bush to Moses. When, when Jesus says, I am, he's making a very clear reference to his divinity, that he is God. Jesus Christ is no mere human being. Your Savior is no mere human being. He is almighty God. He is God in human flesh. And he says, I am. As one author writes, what Jesus is essentially saying to his disciples in the midst of the storm is, don't fear, I am is here. Don't fear, I am is here. Now, you might say this morning, you know, I really wish that um, that would happen to me tomorrow. 
I, I wish that, that Jesus was with me when I went through the things in my life. If, if Jesus came walking up to me tomorrow when I'm going through a difficult day at school or a difficult day at work or when I'm home pulling out my hair, if, if Jesus just came to me, that would really encourage me. But by his spirit, he is with you. He won't ever leave you. So think about your trial right now. Think about your, your burden right now. Think about what makes you anxious and, and fearful. Think about what storm in, in life has come your way. Think about what it is that keeps you awake at night. Think about what it is that makes you anxious. You know, it's wonderful to have friends to support us when, when we are going through a difficult time. It's wonderful to have a church family that will come alongside us when we have a need. But, but first of all, think about the fact that not all of us have close friends and family to support or encourage us. Your closest friends or your family might be far, far away from you. And secondly, at the end of the day, our, our family and close friends, they're, they're mere human beings just like we are. They have their own anxieties and their own fears and their own struggles. But Jesus Christ is almighty God. By his spirit, he is always with us. His grace is super abundant. Therefore, just like he says to his disciples on this lake, he says to you this morning, do not be afraid. I am always with you. And now we see the stillness. Peter, Peter's the impulsive one, right? He's always doing things, always talking first. And, and he says, um, hey, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to the water to you. And, and so Jesus says, okay, come. Now, now this was a pretty, pretty substantial boat that Peter was fishing in. This isn't a, you know, a 16-foot aluminum boat that three of you can get into. Boats in these days would have been uh, able to hold about 15 to 18 men, plus, plus all the, uh, the fish that they would catch. And a, and a boat this size would typically sit several feet above the water line. And, and so imagine if you're Peter. You're, you're in this terrifying storm. The, the wind is blowing at gale force. The waves are crashing against your boat, torturing your boat, the language says. And, and you've got you to step down off that boat and go down a number of feet just to reach the water. It's a long way down. But Peter does it. He, he takes the step of faith. He, he gets out of the boat. And he walks on the water, and he comes to Jesus. Now, this is, a, this is a wonderful illustration of faith. Theologians often speak of the fact that there are, there are three elements of saving faith. They are knowledge, assent, and trust. K-A-T, cat. Just remember it like a Kit Kat bar. Knowledge, assent, and trust. One, you have to know something. That's knowledge. Two, you have to believe that it's true. That, that is assent. And third, you have to believe that it's true for you. That's trust. When we look at Peter here, all three elements of true faith are present. First of all, knowledge. He, he knows that it's Jesus on the water. Secondly, assent, Peter knows that since it is Jesus, Jesus can command Peter to come to him and he will be safe. And third, trust. Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking to Jesus, trusting that Jesus will keep him safe. And this is a beautiful, again, illustration of saving faith. First of all, you must know the essential truth of the Bible, that you are a sinner, that you cannot save yourself, and that only Jesus Christ can save you. Secondly, you must assent that this is true. 
You must say, it's true that I'm a sinner. It's true that I can't save myself. It's, it's true that only Jesus can save me. But then there's the third element, and that is trust. You must, in a sense, get out of the boat and go to Jesus, trusting that he will save you. Peter has done that. He's gotten out of the boat. He's gone down into the water. He's actually walking on the water. But what happens? Verse 30 tells us Peter sees the wind. In fact, you can, you can imagine that all of Peter's senses right now are telling him this is a bad idea. What I'm doing on the middle of this lake is a bad idea. He sees what the wind is doing to the water. He feels the wind pounding against him. He feels the spray of water on his face. He hears the wind whipping the water, whipping the sails. Probably even tastes the water as it's hitting him in the face. And Peter becomes afraid. And children, what happens? Peter starts to sink. But he does the right thing, doesn't he? Rather than going, come on, Peter, just, just keep walking, rather than being like uh, uh, Dory, remember Dory, keep on swimming, keep on swimming, keep on swimming. Rather than doing that, rather than looking to himself, Peter says, Lord, save me. We're a lot like Peter, aren't we? We're a lot like Peter. Peter. We're going through a trial. We're going through a difficulty. We're in a storm of life. And, and rather than keeping our eyes on him and our eyes on his promises, we take our eyes off of him and we put our eyes on our problem and on ourselves. And it's then when we feel overwhelmed. It's then when we feel that there's no way out but, but as Peter begins to sink, he, he knows who to cry out to. He, he cries to Jesus, Lord, save me. Peter knew he couldn't save himself. He, he knew that Jesus could save him. Christian, God, God allows trials to come into our lives to deepen our trust in him. The, the nonsense of the health, wealth, and prosperity movement is stupefying to me. The Bible tells us that, that God allows these trials into our lives. He brings trials into our lives to deepen our trust in him, to, to make us realize that his grace is sufficient in our weakness. Jesus grabs hold of Peter and he says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter had taken his eyes off of Jesus just like we take our eyes off of Jesus. Instead of looking to Jesus and, and resting in his almighty power to, to keep him safe, Peter started looking at the terrible storm around him. And yet, amazing the love and compassion Jesus shows to Peter. Once again, Jesus could have let Peter flail around in the water for a bit. You're going to take your eyes off of me? Go ahead, Peter. See what you can do. But he doesn't do that. There's that word immediately again, three times in this passage, immediately. Verse 31, Jesus immediately grabs Peter by the hand and saves him. One author says Peter may have taken his eyes off of Jesus, but Jesus never took his eyes off of Peter. That's a wonderful truth. You and I may take our eyes off of Jesus, but he will never take his eyes off of us. Notice how it ends. Jesus and Peter get into the boat. The storm stops. The disciples look at Jesus and they say, truly you are the son of God. That's the appropriate response, isn't it, to, to who Jesus is? To worship him. Truly you are the son of God. Two things as we close this morning. Number one, have you gotten out of the boat? 
In other words, you, you may, you're all here in church this morning. I know most of you. Uh, you, you profess Christ, but you have knowledge of him. But, but have you gotten out of the boat and come to him? You say, I know I'm a sinner. I, I know I can't save myself. I know Jesus is the only Savior. I believe that's true. But have you gotten out of the boat and come to him and embraced him and said, I trust you to to save me and deliver me. You are my Lord and Savior. Have you gotten out of the boat? Secondly, most of you are probably dealing with something right now. If you're not, you're going to at some point. You've you got something in your life that is a storm, something that is a difficulty, something that is a trial. And if you don't have it now, again, you will at some point, and the Lord can also use you to minister to people, to those who are in a storm. But let me encourage all of you this morning to meditate on this passage, to, to fix your eyes on Jesus. This isn't a passage primarily about Peter's lack of faith. This is a passage that tells us Jesus is praying for us. This is a passage that that tells us that by his spirit, Jesus is always with us. This is a passage that that says to us, even though there are times when, when you may take your eyes off of Jesus, he will never take his eyes off of you. Children, you might know that um, the ancient Egyptians used to use something called hieroglyphics to, to communicate, like, like pictures. Instead of words, they would use pictures to, to communicate certain things. Did you know what hieroglyphic the Egyptians used for the word impossible? For the word impossible, they they use the image of two feet walking on the water. That's a pretty good symbol for something that's impossible. None of you could go out to somebody's pool today and walk across that pool. It's impossible. But this passage tells us that what is impossible with man is possible for God. Keep your eyes on him this week. Listen, Satan's going to do everything he can this week to get your eyes off of Jesus. You, you've sat here this morning. You've, you've heard this passage about keeping your eyes on Jesus. Your enemy is going to do everything he can this week to get your eyes off of Jesus. Put your eyes on your problem. Put your eyes on this circumstance. He's going to do everything he can to get your eyes off of Jesus. Christian, keep your eyes on Jesus this week. When you go to school, when you go to work, when you're at home, keep your eyes on him. And know that that by his spirit, he is always with you. He is praying for you, and he will never, ever allow you to sink beyond his care. And even when your eyes fall off of him, his eyes will never fall off of you. That is our Savior. That is the one to whom we belong. That is the one we worship this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a passage that so clearly reminds us of what an amazing Savior we have. As we sang earlier, hallelujah, what a Savior. What a Savior is Jesus. One who saves to the uttermost. One who prays for us always. One who is always with us. And one who never takes his eyes off of us. 
Help us, Lord, to rejoice in that and rest in that and help us to fix our eyes on him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together number 227, How Great Thou Art, 227. And that is indeed true about Christ, how great he is. His power, his love, his grace, his faithfulness. Sing stanzas one, three, and four, and let's stand as we sing. Number 570 is our doxology. Uh, just a reminder that the second service today is at 4 p.m. So don't come at 6. Uh, 4 p.m. today is the fourth Sunday. And so back at, at 4 p.m. today uh, to worship the Lord together. And before we sing our doxology, the Lord uh, gives us his blessing. And so receive that blessing now. The love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.